Please remain standing for God's Word. Proverbs chapter 9, reading the whole chapter. It will become self-evident why we're starting in chapter 9 as we work our way through the text tonight. Proverbs chapter 9. Let's hear God's holy word. <clears throat> Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple... Let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of my wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks any sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Let's pray. Open now your word, Lord God, that we might learn of your fear that we might have the knowledge of you, the Holy One, and gain insight. Teach us then, Lord God, to choose the way of wisdom. In every respect, Lord God, we need you. In my speaking, in all our hearing, we need your Spirit, Lord God. That we might know the way of life and discern the way of death. And grant us the faith, Lord God, to choose that right way. For we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Why study Proverbs? I would imagine if I asked for a hand count now, that how many of us had read Proverbs in the last year, I suspect not many of us would have spent any great degree of time in Proverbs. So why study Proverbs? Why begin a series preaching through the book systematically? The answer is pretty simple, and we can go back to Joshua 24, verse 14, uh, for a discussion of that answer. Joshua says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day. Quite simply, there is a choice to be made. It is the choice in Proverbs between the way of wisdom and life and the way of folly and death. There is a choice to be made. Not just in ultimate terms, in terms of salvation, but each day the Christian 
in his or her daily walk is faced by this reality that you have a choice, a choice to choose the path of wisdom or a choice to step down the path of folly and keep going on that path. That choice in Proverbs is frequently represented by the two ways, the way of the wise or the way of the fool. And that choice is presented for us here in Proverbs chapter 9. There's two women, there's two houses, and there's two ends of those who choose each woman. For those who choose the way of wisdom and woman wisdom, there is life, there is learning, there is the multiplication of years. For those who choose woman folly, verse 13 following, what is there? There's death. The dead dwell in her home. Proverbs 9 is the culmination of the first section of the book of Proverbs. That's initially what we're going to preach through in the coming weeks and months, the first nine chapters. I say it's the culmination because it really it, it drives home the point of the previous eight chapters. In the previous eight chapters, there's always that choice between the two ways. Proverbs 1 speaks of the violent man and how wisdom keeps us from violence. Proverbs 2 speaks about the peace of conscience that comes with wisdom. And the opposite is true for those who do not choose wisdom. Proverbs 3 shows us how the wise deal well with money. Proverbs 4 shows us that wisdom will give us a good reputation in society compared to those who choose folly. Proverbs 5 keeps us safe maritally. Proverbs 6 speaks about how wisdom will make us successful in work and once again gives us another warning about marital infidelity. Proverbs 7 Another warning about marital infidelity. Wisdom will protect us from sexual temptation. Proverbs 8, wisdom presents itself to us as better than all the rewards of this life. And what do we have now in Proverbs 9? A choice. Two calls. Woman wisdom and her call to wisdom and life. And woman folly, the adulteress, Calling people unto death. It's a simple choice. That's why we're starting in Proverbs 9. That's the point of the Proverbs. Choose this day. Whether you're an unbeliever or a believer, choose this day whom you will serve. Proverbs, you see, presents to us the reality of covenant life underneath the covenant God who speaks covenant wisdom to us. This is not a book of the pagans. It's a book of the covenant God speaking covenant wisdom into the ears and hearts of his covenant people. And therefore, brethren, it is utterly necessary that we see our Lord Jesus Christ throughout the warp and the woof of Proverbs. When we come to wisdom, there is no wisdom like Jesus Christ. And so Christ is calling us tonight. Christ is instructing us. Christ is showing himself to be present in this wisdom literature, calling you unto life and calling you in the way of blessing. Proverbs chapter 9 has three distinct sections. Two of them I've alluded to already. In the first six verses, we have the way of wisdom. Then in verses 7 to 12, we have something of a commentary on the two ways of the wise and the fool and their two ends. And then verse 13 to verse 18, we have the way of folly. In short, there's a call to you this night, a call to choose well. Choose the way of wisdom. Look then at the way of wisdom in the first six verses. And notice how wisdom here is personified for us. Wisdom has built her house. In Proverbs, we'll come across this uh, literary device. It's personification. What is personification? It's when we describe an inanimate object with human characteristics. 
An inanimate object is described by use of human characteristics. So we might say justice is blind. Well, it's not, of course. It has no eyes. But we describe it as blind when we understand there has been a miscarriage of justice. Frequently in literature, we'll come across this same device. Shakespeare writes, the grey-eyed morn smiles at the frowning night. The night and the morn have been personified, that is, given human characteristics to describe their function. In Proverbs, wisdom is sometimes personified. Chapter 8, verse 1. What is wisdom doing? It's calling out. Understanding is raising her voice. Proverbs chapter 9, wisdom is building a house, is setting a feast, is mixing wine. This is the idea of personification. And what it does for us is it leads us into the text of Proverbs. Proverbs, brethren, is highly picturesque. We're drawn into the images that it portrays for us. We'll find ourselves in the classroom. We'll find ourselves in the living room. We'll find ourselves observing what's going on on street corners, observing the wicked coming together to plot. We'll even find ourselves, uh, brethren, in the bedroom of the adulteress as she plots the downfall of the simple and the fool. And we'll find ourselves studying the ant at his work and in his labor. Yes, Proverbs is designed to draw us in, to form a mental picture. Here, brethren, Proverbs 9, we've got the picture of a street. On one side, there's a house with seven pillars built by woman wisdom. Some way further down on the street, on the other side, is another house. It's the house of woman folly, verse 13. Opposite sides of the street with opposite designs and opposite ends. The second thing you need to note about wisdom here, not only is it personified, but it's personified as a female. Wisdom has built her house. Now, I've said to you that the Lord Jesus Christ is on every page of Proverbs, and indeed he is. And I will show you in the weeks and months that when we deal with wisdom, we are essentially dealing with the person and work of Christ himself. But isn't that a problem? Because wisdom is personified here as a woman, as female. Well, there's a very simple answer to this conundrum. Wisdom, the word in Hebrew, is a female noun. And so to personify wisdom as anything but a woman would be to contradict the very nature of the Hebrew language. But as we examine Proverbs, and as we examine the rest of Scripture, we're going to see very clearly our Lord Jesus Christ's most intimate relationship to the idea of wisdom. Not just because he was wiser or greater than Solomon, but something much more fundamental Christ is for his people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. One of, I think, the most important texts in understanding Proverbs. And because of God, you, that is the Christian, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Jesus Christ became to us wisdom from God. In the same way, as Paul goes on to say, not only did he become wisdom, but he became righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In short, brethren, and I'm not going to exegete this fully tonight, in short, when we read of wisdom in Proverbs, we are to hear the person of Jesus Christ calling unto us. He is to us wisdom. He is the very epitome, the fulfillment of this concept of wisdom. He has become to you, dear friends, wisdom from God. And so, what is going on in the text? What is the call of woman wisdom? What is the call of our Lord Jesus Christ? Wisdom here has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. 
And notice as we're reading the text, I, I hope you notice anyway, that as we get to verse 13, we have an inbuilt contrast. Woman folly does almost precisely the same things and in the same manner as woman wisdom. Just keep that in your minds. We'll come back to that. We have a contrast. Woman wisdom, woman folly. The first thing we learn about woman wisdom is that she has built a house and prepared a remarkable feast. She has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She's built a house. It's a dwelling place in which she can call people in to dwell with her. It's a habitation. It's a place where she is going to feast and wine and dine all those that love her and come to her. And it's a house with seven pillars. Most Jewish houses did not have any pillars. But this house... What a remarkable house it is. It stands out as you walk down this road. It has seven pillars. Now, you know the number seven in Scripture symbolizes the idea of perfection and completion. And what what has she done? She has created a dwelling place characterized by seven pillars. She has created a dwelling place associated with the number seven, the idea of perfection, much like our triune God did in the days of creation, creating for us a dwelling place in which the Son would dwell with his people in the space of six days, seven days with rest, and all very good. We have here another creation, another dwelling place, where wisdom will dwell with the people who will come to the feast, and there will be a great and a glorious feast. This is what wisdom has to offer. She has slaughtered her beast, she has mixed her wine, she has also set her table. Everything that wisdom is doing is designed to lay a glorious and opulent spread for those who respond to her call. She's calling people in to associate and fellowship with her. Christ, in other words, is calling his people to come under him for life, to be fed with what the best wine, mixing of the wine is not watering it down, it's the adding of spices to make it even better, with the best wine, and she set a table, and she slaughtered her beasts. It's a picture of a good, a gracious, a wise host calling people in, saying, come and dine with me, come and fellowship with me, come and eat and drink of the best things you can eat. It's a picture of God fellowshipping with his people. And brethren, this is dealing with a theme that has come up previously in Scripture and will also come up again in Scripture later on. This idea of eating and drinking in the presence of God is not new. In fact, it happens at the most important times in Scripture. Exodus 24 is the record of the Old Covenant being confirmed. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders go and meet with God. And he gives them the Old Covenant. And they sacrifice. And blood is shed. And yet what happens at the end of this passage in chapter 24, verse 9 following... Previously, they couldn't go anywhere near God on Mount Sinai. If they even touch the mountain, they're dead. They come near the mountain where God resided, and they were dead. What happens now? Verse 9, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, the 70 elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness, And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. Listen, they beheld God and ate and drank. They had a feast in the presence of God as the old covenant was ratified. They had fellowship with God. They drank undoubtedly wine. They ate in the presence of God. It's the same kind of language that we pick up. In the making of the new covenant, Luke chapter 22, uh, sorry, yes, 22, verse 14 following. 
This is precisely the scene once again. The disciples are doing what? They're sat down with God, with Christ. And what are they doing? They're eating and drinking. This is my body, says our Lord as he takes the bread. This is my blood as he gives them what? Wine. The old covenant feast, the new covenant feast. And now here is woman wisdom saying, come into my house. Enjoy the blessedness of this feast that I have prepared for you. This is Christ calling his people into a living relationship with himself. And he's showing you what there is to be gained by entering woman wisdom's house, by finding wisdom, by knowing the fear of the Lord, by having the knowledge of the Holy One of Israel. And just in case we don't quite get the message of what she's doing, moreover in verses 3 to 6 she sends out messengers, people carrying the message of what she's done. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways, listen, and live. Leave your simple ways and live. And walk in the way of insight. She's sending out her young women as messengers. As I was preaching this morning, it dawned on me, what is the Samaritan woman? She's one of wisdom's messengers being sent out, carrying the message of life. In fact, it's not just these young women who are calling. Literally, we read in the Hebrew there, she has sent out her young women. She, wisdom, calls. Again, we have that same picture, do we not? As we saw in the Samaritan woman narrative, that as Christ sends his disciples out to work, he continues to work. That's precisely the message here. She sent out her young women. She calls. Wisdom calls. Christ himself calls to his people. And these young women, they go where? To the highest places in town. Remember that. You're going to read it again in verse 13 following. The highest places in the town, the places of prominence from which the message of woman wisdom can be heard and discerned. And brethren, remember this. This is a covenant document from the covenant God to the covenant people. This is not woman wisdom going out first and foremost into the nations round about. No, it's an appeal to the covenant people. That itself tells us much about the nature of wisdom. That if the appeal is going out to the covenant people, it stands to reason that not all the covenant people possess wisdom. Which is why we're preaching it tonight. Which is why God has given it to us. That we might possess wisdom. And what are they calling people to hear? They're calling them to hear the word of God. The second Helvetic confession says the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Of God. Is that not what also Paul said in 1 Thessalonians? That when you receive the word of God, he says to them, you received it for what it really is, not the word of man, but the word of God. That's why we dare not miss, as providence allows, we dare not miss the preaching of the word of God. If you knew that God would be here tonight, and he is of course, that if he could stand here before you, none of us would not dream of missing the means of grace. And yet the scripture tells us clearly when the word is preached, when these young women go out, even when Sunday school teachers teach, when you witness to your friends, when the word of God is going forth, it is the very word of God. And they go out with the message. The message is this to the simple. Simple, turn in here. See the house with seven pillars on the right? Get in there. That's the place where the simple want to be. To the one who lacks sense, come and feast. Come and eat my bread. Drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. The simple here is not the fool. The fool in Proverbs is the one who says there is no God. The fool is the unbeliever. The simple is the one who is young in faith, who lacks wisdom, who lacks understanding. 
It's the very purpose that Proverbs was given to us. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 4. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, verse 4, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. And yet the reality is, brethren, is it not, that each one of us here, regardless of how many years we have been in the faith, we act like the simpleton. We behave as the simple, the one who is a youth in the faith. Every time we entertain sin... We behave as the simple one. And so this word is not just for those who are novices in the faith. It's for everyone. And the word of wisdom is this. Come and eat bread with me. Come and drink wine with me. Leave your ways behind and feast with me. Feast on bread. Feast on wine. John 6, 53, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live. Have life. Have life. The gospel is in every verse of Proverbs. Have life. And it's interesting here in Proverbs chapter 9, the word for wisdom at the beginning of the passage is actually a plural noun. A plural noun. It's not just wisdom, it's wisdoms. And that's not to suggest there's different forms of wisdom. There's only one wisdom. But in Hebrew, you have something that is called a plurality of majesty. It's kind of a bit like the Queen of England who who speaks in the first person plural, we. This is God saying to us, this is not just any old wisdom. This is divine wisdom. This is majestic wisdom. There is majesty that comes with this wisdom and therefore there is a glory and a majesty which is attached to what this wisdom will do. That is to say, wisdom will provide for us more than we could ever imagine. What is on offer from from, uh, woman wisdom, what is on offer is opulent and glorious and majestic. She's prepared a mansion, bread, wine, life. This is Christ calling unto us now. Leave your simple ways behind and find life. We understand the nature of this call, do we not? It's very important. Four elements, I'm going to say the very opposite of these when we come to woman folly. The first thing about this call of woman wisdom, it is active and intentional. It is sent out. It goes forth. And that's good for us. It's very good that this message goes out and comes to us because there's another message that is going out and coming to us. And it's the message of woman folly. And she says also, come into my house. Eat this sweet bread and die. This message is intentional and active. Secondly, this message expresses the truth. Woman wisdom expresses the truth. It is a call to know God, a call to find God, verse 12, sorry, verse uh, 10 and verse 11. It is a call to find the fear of the Lord, uh, insight, knowledge of the Holy One, to find it is life and blessing. And in this call, thirdly, it shows itself to be full of blessedness and glory. It's calling us to a closer relationship with God and revealing to us that as we draw close to God, we will be filled with glory and blessedness. And fourth, it shows us our Lord and our Savior, one who calls us, one who beckons us to fellowship and to feast with Him. I'm going to skip verses 6 to 12. Let's move to verse 13, the contrasting call. 
the competing call. Note this. Everything that woman wisdom does and says is replicated by woman folly. That tells us something about the nature of sin. Proverbs has much to say about the fool and about folly. There is another way, apart from the way of wisdom, that one can take. It is the way of folly. It's the way which Proverbs says seems right to man. It seems reasonable. It seems enjoyable. It seems fulfilling. But that way, Proverbs says, is the way of death. This is the way of woman folly. Again, she's personified as a woman. What's she doing? She is also at a house. She is also calling out. And this picture of the woman folly saturates the first nine chapters of Proverbs. Back in chapter 5, chapter 6, especially in chapter 7, we find the warning against the adulteress, about against adulterous relationships and people who practice adultery. Chapter 7, verse 6, this is Solomon saying, At the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight in the evening. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud, wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Verse 21, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. Now, that's a particular warning against the adulteress. And it's without doubt the fact that woman folly here draws on many of those same images. But I think woman folly here is more than just uh, the epitome of the seductress, of the adulteress. She's the epitome of everything that counters woman wisdom. As woman wisdom calls us unto God through faith in Jesus Christ... Woman folly calls us away from God by pursuing our own ends, by engaging in the forbidden, in doing what is unlawful. Notice the description of her verse 13. She's loud, and yet she's also seductive. But she knows nothing. Isn't that striking? People who know nothing ought not be loud. People who know nothing ought not be loud because they reveal by their loudness that they know nothing. And yet this world is filled with loud voices of people who what? Who know nothing and are trying to seduce. Isn't that the reality? It's a bad place to start. The one who is loud, seductive and knows nothing, and it's an even worse place to finish. He does not know that the dead are in her house, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Notice verse 13 and 14 following, and verse 15, actually verse 16 also. It is a replication of what woman wisdom did. Woman folly sits at the door of her house. Woman wisdom has built her house. She takes her seat, it says, in the highest places of town, just like woman wisdom. She's calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way, but she's trying to lure them in, uh, just as woman wisdom is sending out the message, calling in the simple. And her message is also to the simple, verse 16, whoever is simple, let him turn in here, just like woman wisdom. Brethren, do we begin to see what's going on here in Proverbs? we get a very vivid picture of competing enemies, woman wisdom and woman folly. Do we not see, brethren, here the purpose, the ways, the manner and design of both Satan as, and sin? 
You see, as wisdom calls, so in like manner does sin. What do we have? We have a counterfeit Christ present in Proverbs. That's right. A counterfeit, a false Christ. I'll go as far as calling it the, the spirit of Antichrist. It's a counterfeit Christ that wants your soul, wants to devour you and destroy you. Replicating and imitating woman wisdom. We're going to see this as when we eventually come to 2 Thessalonians. That the great Antichrist at the end of time replicates the Messiah himself. Setting himself up as the true Messiah. Woman folly is doing the same thing. She's engaging in the same actions. She's targeting the same audience. But to an entirely different end. Brethren, do we begin to see what sin is doing to us as we live in this world of sin? Every time you switch your TV on, and I'm not anti-TV, but every time you switch your TV on, your laptop, your cell phone, the pages of magazines, what's happening? There is an attempt to seduce you by a loud person who knows nothing. That's what's going on. You can't even watch a sport contest without deplorable amounts of flesh on show that, these days. Why? They're trying to seduce you. But they're seducing you without knowledge, with emptiness, with poverty, even with death. Brethren, we need to understand this if we don't. There is an enemy out there who wants to destroy your soul. They might be loud, they might not know anything, but they're seducers, and they're not stupid. They're not stupid, and they're calling upon you. They're calling upon you, because there's an allurement here. Uh, the adulteress, the woman folly, is seeking to lure you in. She calls, verse 16, to the simple. She says, like woman wisdom said, turn in here. Come on in. Verse 17, she appeals to the forbidden nature of her activities, whether it's sexual immorality or anything else, but certainly there's a picture of sexual immorality here. Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. It's a picture of sexual immorality. It's a pe picture of our society. Society says the forbidden thing is good. What a thrill that which is forbidden gives us. It gives us a high, oh, it's sweet, it's pleasant. Do not be deceived. Please do not be deceived. Not a single one of you here tonight, don't be deceived. This is lies. There is nothing sweet about that which is forbidden. There is nothing pleasant about that which is prohibited by the law of God. The end of disobedience is bitter. It's foul. It stinks. It's appalling. And there is, brethren, so much to lose. So much to lose. Don't be fooled by the message of the seductress, the message of the world, Sin lies, sin deceives, sin does not fulfill, and sin will kill you. If you're looking at something, especially men, if you're looking at something you shouldn't be looking at, stop. And that goes for women as well. Stop. You cannot afford a little sin here or a little sin there. Before you know it, you're up to your neck in sin and you're drowning in the sin that you have created. There's no such thing as a little sin here or a little sin there. At what cost will this behavior bring? Verse 18. The simpleton who has gone into the home does not know that the dead are there. The walking dead are real. 
Not the TV show, The Walking Dead are real. But all around us, those who have chosen the path of folly and gone into the home of woman folly, in whatever respect in life, sexual immorality is just one part of that. They're dead. And their sin has killed them from the inside out. It's eaten away at their souls until they cannot do without their sin. To pursue folly, brethren, is to pursue antichrist. Is to pursue oneself. And ultimately to pursue one's own destruction. Do we understand the nature of this call, brethren, from woman folly? What I said of woman wisdom, I say also now again, but in the opposite way. The call of woman wisdom was active and intentional. Just so, brethren, is the call of woman folly. It is active and intentional. And its intention is your demise, your death, eternally, just as Satan did in the garden. Secondly, Whereas the call of woman wisdom relies or speaks the truth, the call of woman folly relies on lies. It calls us not to know God, not to find wisdom, not to find life or blessing, but to find fulfillment in selfishness, to find fulfillment in that which is forbidden. It's forbidden it's not going to bring blessing. Thirdly, woman wisdom shows herself to be full of blessedness and glory. Woman folly masks what she really is. She says, come in and have a good time. What does the simple man find when he gets there? The dead. The place of Sheol. Woman wisdom seeks to show us our Lord and our Savior. Woman folly seeks to obscure Christ from your view. To make him unnecessary. To make him a legalist and a killjoy. To make him folly itself. Which is why, brethren, not only do you need to make the choice each day of your lives... But you also need the encouragement of woman wisdom. She says in Proverbs 8, chapter 17, uh, verse 17, I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me. Enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit, she says, is better than gold even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasures. Do you want your treasures filled, brethren? Filled with blessings that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Choose this day whom you will serve. And every day of your lives, choose this day whom you will serve. Wisdom calls you. She's built her house. She's hewn her seven pillars. She's slaughtered her beasts. She's mixed her wine. She's sent out her young women to call from the highest places. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live. Live. May God grant us the faith to choose woman wisdom. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord God, grant us that faith that perceives the danger, that hates the danger, that hates the sin, and turns to Christ. Present him to us, Lord God. Present yourself in Indeed, Lord, in your triune majesty to us as we work through your word and your wisdom. Show us Jesus Christ and him crucified. Show us our wisdom that we might walk according to these paths. We pray it in Jesus' name.
Amen.